This meeting is now being recorded. Well, again, welcome to today's webinar. Um, very briefly, I'm Caitlin Howley, and I'm fortunate enough to serve as the Associate Director of the Appalachia Regional Comprehensive Center, or the ARC. ARC is one of 15 regional centers that's funded by the U.S. Department of Education to provide capacity building technical assistance to state departments of education and other education stakeholders. Um, we serve Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and uh, West Virginia. I'm really pleased to introduce today's presenters to you. Um, first up is Dr. Homan, Hobart Harmon. He's one of the nation's leading experts on public education in rural America. Um, he's currently an independent consultant and co-director of the Rural Math Excel Partnership which is a project funded by a 2012 U.S. Department of Education um, Investing in Innovation Grant and operated by the Virginia Advanced Study Strategy. He served as an executive assistant to the superintendent of the West Virginia Department of Education, associate director and acting director of the Eric Clearinghouse on Rural Education and Small Schools, and a senior research and development specialist in a regional educational laboratory. His work has been honored by the National Rural Education Association and he's published widely in the Rural Educator and the Journal of Research in Rural Education. John Hill also joins us today. Uh, he's Executive Director of the National Rural Education Association and is a Professor of Education Studies at Purdue. He served as a middle school math teacher, middle and high school principal, assistant superintendent, and superintendent. He's also involved in the Purdue Educational Leadership Initiative for Small and Rural Schools and the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship Program. His interests uh, primarily uh, include the role of instructional leaders at the district and building levels, rural education leadership, and rural capacity. And we're very pleased to have them both here today. Uh, very briefly, so you have a sense of where we're going, our objective today is to consider strategies for supporting rural school districts in terms of implementing best and promising practices, increasing fiscal, fiscal capacity, recruiting and retaining teachers, developing policy and building partnerships, and finally, increasing economies of scale. So let's get rolling. I'm going to turn things over to Hobart now. Hobart, it's all yours. Thanks, Caitlin. It's indeed a pleasure to be able to participate in this webinar, one of the few activities around the country that is focusing on the unique needs of school systems in rural areas. And in this presentation, uh, John Hill and I have taken some of the information from a previous webinar that the ARCC sponsored, and here we attempt to address some of the issues regarding the capacity limitations of small and rural school districts. This is a particular uh, challenge in some places more than others, particularly where the school systems might be located in isolated areas of the country. In the four states, of course, that target this webinar, I think it's surprising to some to know that uh, there are very small school systems. Uh, as we learned in the last school system, the person who was participating as a co-presenter had a school system with about 800 students. That's not real common in Virginia because they're countywide consolidated school systems as they are in, in the four states that uh, we're addressing, but I know uh, John Hill, the co-presenter in this one, will, will particularly be uh, referencing some situations that are particularly applicable to the, to the small ones that may exist uh, west of the Mississippi. I'd like to start first by addressing this issue of implementing best practices, and of course this webinar is focused on support strategies. How can state departments provide uh, technical assistance in particular, or along with that, a range, in fact, initiatives that can be expected to be implemented in rural places. And, and of course, we're talking about small rural school districts or rural school districts. So some of the very uh, basic issues, of course, in this topic of implementing a best practice, which is a concern almost in any state across the country, there is an initial interest to identify a best practice, a model, a program, something that is believed to be essential for school systems to best serve kids, and therefore an initiative is underway 
with the hope that school systems will implement it. Some of the very basic concerns, of course, is, as we've listed here, determine first, of course, if the practice was, in fact, designed for use in a rural context. While that seems like common sense, it is most often the common practice that specific initiatives are developed in urban places with the hope that they will be useful for school systems in rural places. So it's particularly a concern if a practice was, in fact, designed in a rural context, and to if evidence exists regarding the success of that practice from use in a rural place. Technical assistance, of course, is absolutely essential, as we learned in the last webinar, because of the limitation capacity of, of many rural systems. And so the focus of the technical assistance coming out of a State Department, while it may be common to focus on a central office as an efficiency strategy, particularly in countywide systems, there may be a need to examine who, in fact, is supposed to implement the practice and be concerned with focusing the technical assistance on that particular level of the school system. So if it's math teachers that's supposed to implement something, assuming that contacting central office people will result in a math teacher receiving the appropriate information uh, could be an erroneous assumption. The issue of avoiding the one model fits all approach, I think all of us are aware of, of that concern. The only thing that makes that worse is also then one that's developed in an urban place for which then we have a one model expected for everyone to implement and it may not be possible at all. And another basic concern, of course, is in technical assistance, it's easy to, in providing a generic approach, make an assumption that information, enough of it, will enable people to implement a best practice, when in fact this could very easily simply overload the person who's wearing a multiple hat in the local school system and therefore it achieve the opposite effect. So in essence, a more strategic technical assistance approach focused specifically on the person who's supposed to implement the practice is a better strategy. Some of the things that a Department of Ed uh, can consider when I was in the State Department uh, and, and, of course, uh, frequently talk with people in those capacities still. Things are changing for the good, I think. Uh, for example, we now have web-based kind of practices, and so a State Department can very quickly establish a repository and particularly have practical how-to documents on that website such that the people in the rural areas now have access to resources like that that they didn't have in, in a not too distant past. So a web-based repository of best practices with the related how-to documents can be an essential kind of useful uh, assistance item by a State Department. Uh, integrated professional development, of course, we know is occurring in most places. Uh, in, in question, however, though, may be whether or not the essential support materials are with that, and that was addressed in the first workshop uh, with the co-presenter indicating in the small district he was in oftentimes no one's available to develop materials and so forth, so you can have professional development, but if the materials are not there to accommodate implementation, you shouldn't expect much to happen. Webinars, of course, presented by a panel of in-state rural practitioners tends to be effective because people want to hear from people like themselves. So any State Department assistance where webinars can involve people who are actually performing the role that's expected to be implemented tend to be successful. Face-to-face -face conferences with a specific rural strand have success. People still want to be in face-to-face -face meetings. However, again, having a rural focus strand of some sort will be most attractive and beneficial to the people from the small rural school systems. YouTube demonstrations, of course, are becoming more common and they're very effective because they're a just-in-time, flexible kind of delivery where people who want to watch it at 7 o'clock at evening can do so. Network of field-based practitioners and innovators is an excellent strategy for a person in the State Department of Ed to know some key people in the school systems who they can rely upon and ask questions about a particular best practice to see whether or not before rolling it out it could have the intended effect or whether there are going to be unintended consequences which a person would like to avoid. An evaluation checklist approach is, is useful. That is, uh, people having information that enables them to quickly gauge progress 
in the process as well as the impact of a particular best practice. And so with people that are wearing multiple hats, simply having a quick way of examining what they're doing in a checklist format accommodates a capacity limitation of less time available by personnel. Recognition of a school and or individual success is an important item for trying to get best practices implemented because practitioners pay attention to each other's success as does school board members, as do school board members. Uh, partnership with support organizations is almost essential in small rural school district locations, whether it's a regional education service agency or a co-op or a center or some university kind of entity. Support kind of partnerships are essential to give the capacity for many small rural school districts to implement a best practice. Including personnel from a rural LEA to serve on state committees can be very helpful to help give insight to the development of a best practice as well as to be an advocate for people in the rural areas who are asking questions about a particular practice. So uh, many states try to do this when implementing a particular best practice, get input from a committee structure that includes a rural LEA individual. Funding incentives, of course, are important in some places regarding uh, personnel use of time and particularly where they don't have personnel. So initiatives of best practice that are expected to be implemented by existing personnel with no funds provided to hire an additional person, which is an absolute essential person in a key uh, project, will have little chance of implementation. Uh, research, development, evaluation studies, of course, the reality in many places when you ask people, what do you really know about your rural school districts in the state? It simply causes more questions to be asked uh, than answers. We don't find a lot of evidence of many studies going on that pay particular attention to how particular practices will work in rural areas so that research, development, evaluation studies focused on rural specific can be an essential kind of activity to help implement a best practice. Well, I'll uh, spend the next few minutes focusing on supportive strategies for increasing fiscal capacity, and I do want to thank everyone for the opportunity to speak, and uh, these remarks will be made from a, from a national perspective. But some of the things that the Department of Eds could do in, in terms of building capacity would be in, in the area of grant writing assistance and the use of awards funds for professional development specifically, uh, consider uh, employing full-time grant writers for rural districts. Uh, they do not have the uh, capacity to write proposals of consistent high quality to be competitive, competitive in many instances. And, and then beyond that point, uh, districts may not have the personnel to monitor those grants possibly if they do win. Uh, another example would be flexibility in the use of federal and state funds. And be thinking along those lines, how can you leverage state dollars to gain federal dollars? And think beyond the Department of Education. There are many other federal departments that have monies available uh, uh, for educational purposes. You know, an example that doesn't even come from a department that, that comes from the FCC is this whole E-rate issue. Uh, and some states uh, apply as a state uh, to provide Internet service to, to really drive the cost way down for local school districts. Uh, consider competitive grants for rural LEAs or schools, and that would be part of your program at, at the state level, which would give them some capacity to try some things that they ordinarily wouldn't have the, the facilities nor the personnel to get involved in. Be, a, be an advocate for the funding of rural schools and, and look at the impact that sparsity funding allocations may have in state aid formulas. In fact, what we see from our organization around the country uh, is an effort to pull out those um, indicators for rural schools and general ed funds, uh, and, and so that needs to be monitored. And then 
look at state uh, transportation aid. For example, uh, some states have what's called a linear density index, and that is they, they look at the number of pupils per mile as a factor in calculating uh, funding for transportation so that if uh, students are spread out, then uh, rural districts receive more dollars per student per mile in terms of funding those services. Uh, designated funding for facilities, labs, technologies. Many, many rural districts uh, do not have a large tax base. The manufacturing jobs have left. Uh, the the uh, number of people that are involved in farming due to uh, increased mechanization and, and the use of uh, technology have decreased. Um, and um, and so there, there needs to be assistance in terms of updating labs. We just participated in a study, I think it was three years ago, where the average rural lab was either had been remodeled 14 years ago or had been built 14 years ago. And uh, when we look at, at labs, especially in schools today, the use of probes, the use of micro labs, the use of virtual labs, this is a whole different ball game. And many rural districts need help in uh, in that particular area. Loan forgiveness programs. Uh, there are some uh, state programs where if a teacher or an administrator moved to a, a rural school, especially in a in tough to fill positions, that uh, their loans are forgiven over a period of time or they receive assistance for loans. And then sharing and, and collaboration incentives among uh, LEAs and, and began to think about what are things that you could do that would cause districts to share services, uh, to um, share personnel perhaps, uh, and again, uh, think beyond schools. Um, we have some interesting things in some states where schools, local government, and hospitals uh, create consortiums to uh, purchase products or to provide services. Uh, so uh, those are, are some ideas in terms of increasing fiscal capacity of rural districts. Great. Thanks very much, John. Um, Kim, will you please unmute the participants' phone line? Um, we'd like to pause and see if there are any questions or comments. All guests have been unmuted. So feel free to speak up if you have any questions or comments. Alternatively, um, please feel free to ask questions uh, or make comments in the chat box if you prefer. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't sound as though we have any questions at this point, so we'll continue with the, um, the rest of the webinar. Kim, will you please mute participants' phone lines at this point? All guests have been muted. You can unmute your line by pressing star six. Thanks very much, Kim. Okay, I'll turn it back over to John and Hobart. Just uh, a couple thoughts here on supporting strategies for teacher recruitment and retention. Um, be thinking of becoming part of some rural transition to teaching programs, especially in the STEM fields. Uh, uh, I've personally been involved in one of those programs where we recruit mathematicians and scientists, and uh, we found funding uh, to pay their tuition while they're in school and to pay their living expenses. And in return for that training and licensing, they have to teach in a uh, rural school for a three-year period, and, and obviously if they complete that obligation, then they don't have to pay anything back. Uh, the other thing that, that we see in some states, uh, especially in, in the western part of the United States, is providing housing at a lower cost for teachers, especially in the STEM areas. Uh, and in one particular district in Colorado, the, the Building Trades Program has built seven houses. Uh, and those are made available to teachers and administrators at a, uh, for a rent that is considerably lower than if they were renting from some of those in town. 
Another thing to think about is creating a leadership academy for district and school leaders. And these would be uh, persons who are already on the job, but the job is changing radically. Uh, many administrators, especially in rural areas, are isolated. Uh, they need to, to keep, keep up with their craft, and they need to be involved in networking and collaboration with others, and, and leadership academies provide them the opportunity to do those three. Holder? Yes, and, and I believe, unless the slide is different for other people, the one I'm looking at is one slide that's advanced. Uh, I believe we need to go back to one slide where it's the supportive strategies for teacher recruitment and retention, Caitlin. There we are, and we'll just quickly, a uh, couple items to highlight here. Uh, State Departments of Education uh, in most states commonly approve teacher education programs in some fashion, so knowing whether or not those uh, programs have some consideration in them for graduates who might then go to rural areas. So that's something State Departments of Ed uh, might consider as they examine the issue of teacher prep and how then consequently people who have a student taught in rural areas and so forth and have been informed of what it might mean to teach in a rural school location might be in a better position to be successful as a teacher and of course that as we all know uh, is a positive aspect if you hope to retain a teacher. That first year of experience can be so critical and whether or not there's a mentoring program. Uh, training and recognizing cooperating teachers or student teachers in rural schools uh, could be something that could be uh, examined and advocated by the State Department of Education, a web-based depository of, of job announcements for rural public schools, and I think a lot of states are doing this. Uh, some are using ed service agency systems, but making job announcements more available because the pool of candidates is a particular issue in rural places. Uh, examples of effective recruitment strategies for rural schools would be useful to make those available. A few years ago I developed a, a document for the Southeast Regional Laboratory uh, involving superintendents in the states in the Southeast uh, where that document suggested strategies and so forth for how to recruit teachers in hard to serve places. Uh, subject specific mentoring programs are critical in rural areas and of course we know the problem of why they don't exist. Typically if you've got one algebra teacher in a, in a high school it's kind of hard to give a mentoring experience by someone in that same subject. So some programs are evolving now over the web and so forth to help subject specific teachers get the kind of mentoring experience. A generic experience will be adequate for a person understanding the school culture, being able to address policies in the school system and so forth, but it's the subject specific content area that is the one that typically is not addressed. Parent and family community engagement kinds of issues are important, particularly in working in a rural place where you cannot escape the reality as a teacher of having to meet with parents and family members uh, on the street or of course maybe in school, but it's a much different experience where teachers are absolutely uh, absorbed as their personal uh, experiences in the community become essential and information that people know about. So how to work in an area becomes important. There are others that people can consider, but we want to move on to the uh, area of support strategies for policy development and partnership building. This first one, of course, is one that may exist in states uh, because you now have a coordinator for the REAP program. However, uh, that person may also be a multiple hat wearer, just like the people in the school systems, and they may not have much time for that role except for unique times during the year. But it's important if it can uh, happen that in the State Department of Ed, someone is knowledgeable about the rural school systems and can share information, and of course these are most successful where that person has some access to the chief state school officer, as when I was in West Virginia, the state superintendent's um, access, because oftentimes people may or may not have access to that position such that the a adequate information about rural schools uh, are able to, to be there. Now you can encourage pilot periods or longer implementation periods for new state board policies in the rural school systems. They with the adequate or with the inadequate uh, personnel 
are likely to need some longer implementation periods. And of course, I think good practice, regardless of whether rural or urban, is to pilot initiatives first in some small scale way to determine if the impact will be and the consequences will be what's expected. The issue of collecting credible results of a policy's impact in rural LEAs we would like to think uh, occurs. However, what we see most often happening is a study or some uh, document report will be produced that says a particular initiative is being implemented and what the results are, but it's seldom that you see any results specific to the rural school systems. So therefore, it's a missed opportunity for sharing the successes and the lessons learned so that the rural school systems can have some knowledge base as well as uh, some hope that that practice is intended for them. Customized reporting requirements. Uh, someone has often mentioned that we need a short form for the small rural LEAs like we do with the IRS for doing our income tax. The reality is they have to fill out the same information whether you have three schools in your school system or whether you have 30. And of course this becomes an issue where there is very limited personnel. Uh, the, Forming partnerships to address mutually beneficial goals of schools and communities is important. And I know here, uh, John, you would you want to share some particular kinds of activities that are possible. Sure. In, in many of our rural communities, access to medical care is, is very difficult. And as time moves forward and, and new policies are implemented in terms of health care, it will become even more difficult to staff uh, offices in rural areas. And the U.S. Department of, of Agriculture is, is submitting, or is, uh, I think it's $17 million in grants are available right now to implement telemedicine in, in rural areas, specifically using uh, schools as the, um, as the focal point. Uh, and these telemedicine centers can be used with many insurance companies, Medicare, Medicaid, CHIPS programs, and so forth. But where where departments of ed can really help out is making local districts aware of these grants and, and educating how these telemedicine centers can be integrated with local uh, insurance benefits uh, and then helping them come up with a local match. And there are companies out there that are willing to make the local matches. So that's a big one. Um, Working with Cooperative Extension Service, especially in some of their STEM in that, uh, initiatives, their popcorn economy initiatives, uh, project-based learning initiatives. Again, uh, in essence, this is another set of educators that can uh, help us in our, our goals. And so I would encourage a cooperation between the Department of Ed and the Cooperative Extension Service. As the uh, U.S. Department of Ed uh, is in the process of developing uh, core assessments, when you look at those RFPs for the PARC Consortium and the Smarter Balance Consortium, um, they are required to create libraries of resources. And in those libraries of resources will be sample lesson plans, formative assessments, uh, professional developments on how to teach each of the standards in language arts and mathematics, and so it, it's going to be critically important for department of, departments of ed to become familiar with those and really encourage local districts uh, to uh, utilize those resources. Now the, the fields of occupational therapy, speech therapy, and some, some issues with autism can all be dealt with over the Internet and uh, departments of ed can be familiar with those services. Uh, again, it's hard to find uh, therapists to work in sparse areas or districts are paying those individuals from port to port when they travel to provide therapy. And when it's done over the Internet, you only pay for the time. And the Bowling, uh, State, uh, Bowling Green State University have, has done some interesting research in this area that has found that uh, especially in the 
areas of speech therapy that this therapy is as effective or more effective over the Internet than it is face-to-face, and it's more efficient in terms of cost. And finally, economic development. Uh, look at partnering with other departments within uh, state government and other departments within the federal government to assist local districts in their economic development uh, efforts. Uh, again, uh, if we can help a local district build capacity, then uh, that builds uh, the financial capacity su- to support uh, educational efforts. I think, uh, are we going to break for some questions at this point? Uh, I think we're going to finish the uh, rest of the material before we break for questions. Okay. okay that thanks. sounds good. Uh, I wanted to mention uh, one thing about the economic development uh, for rural. Of course, uh, there's a certain reality here uh, that in many cases may not be reinforced by the concept of what ed reform is. I recall back when I served in the state superintendent's office and served on a state rural development council, the fact of the matter was the only time public school education was ever brought up was when I would bring it up because people in rural areas know it's a better investment of scarce resources to invest in sewer systems and roads and health care and those kinds of things than it is to invest in young people that are going to be leaving the rural area. So there's a reality therapy here that we need to be aware of that this partnership of how public schools not being excluded from the real world concerns of local places that relate to bettering communities. And the reason I bring that up is because in too many places public education has in fact become a separate entity. And John, as you mentioned earlier about the Extension Service, if you talk to people in the Extension Service, they will quickly tell you that they've almost been excluded from the public school curriculum because of the, uh, in some measure, no child left behind law or state accountability measures where everything that is to be offered in a public school has to be tied to the state accountability standards. So they have to go and revise all of their programs and so forth in order to get into a public school. I simply bring this up to say that Uh, In a State Department of Education role, being a partner with other agencies in the state helps, particularly in also advocating public schools as a solution to the issues of economic development and workforce development in rural places. And it's important to note that because in too many places it's being considered not a benefit. Simply graduating students from a public school system and indicating that there may have been a good education experience is in of itself not convincing to people that they need to invest in public education, particularly if it is only providing evidence of how students end up having to leave the area. So it's a win-win relationship of schools working together, but that has to start at the state level as well of working with other state agencies. Uh, Strategies for increasing economies of scale are important as we move to the next Next one, Caitlin. And this is because of the limited capacity that the school systems have. And there's a whole host of things that can be done by uh, the State Department of Education in thinking about how they might support increasing economies of scale. Uh, Let's see, did did our slide move to the next one? The slide we're on is the supporting strategies for increasing economies of scale capacity. Yeah, I advanced it to that one. Oh, okay. Well, mine, had, mine hadn't moved yet. <laughs> <That's> not <real laughs> technology is moving slower out here. So I'm a victim of reality. So some of the things that can be uh, supported from a State Department of Ed perspective, and again, we're focusing particularly here on uh, the systems of educational service agencies, whether it's Reese's in West Virginia or cooperatives in Kentucky or centers, or some other kind of configuration. And there again, these don't exist in all states, but they do exist in 45 states. So the issue of how we're trying to increase economies of scale as a support structure, and then how state departments, in fact, link with these in ways that it helps deal with some of the capacity limitations of rural school systems is important. For example, uh, the vetting of programs and, and products is an important one. And John, I think you wanted to say a little something about this one. 
Right. There are there are just a ton of people producing online programs. And quite frankly, in many rural areas, uh, rural districts are looking to online programs uh, to maintain a variety of, of classes or, or for credit recovery, those kinds of things. But what I can share with you that much of it is of low quality. Uh, and these programs need to be vetted for rigor. They need to be vetted for accuracy. They need to be vetted to see that they're the kinds of things that students will become engaged in. And, and the programs need to have uh, the ability to hold students accountable not only throughout the course in terms of formative assessments and so forth, but in terms of, of an end product. And so it would really help um, many rural districts if we were to vet those programs for them uh, and, and let them know what's out there. And then the, uh, the synthesis and use of student data at the school level. They're, our teachers are trained to teach, and they're just not data experts. And we need people in the state departments who can explain the use of data, and it must be in terms that are useful for teachers and administrators, and you know, it also has to be done in a way that it, it can be useful to their clients also. And so uh, finding individuals within the State Department that can do that is, is critical to building capacity at the local level. Hobart? Another another issue with that particular one uh, is the issue that unless the information is presented to the school system and particularly at the school level in a way that the principal and, and teachers can use it, it's very unlikely that the teachers themselves are going to have time to disaggregate data and present it uh, in ways that we think will be most useful for them. It's simply a timing issue, and in some cases, John, I know you're mentioning it's an, it's an expertise issue as well. So the whole issue of data use we know is important. Uh, there's a belief, of course, that for teachers to take ownership in the problems or deficiencies of a school that they have to be using data. But the point is somebody else has to be crunching the data, putting it into infographics or presentations that teachers can look at and make some determinations, not all the other assorted kinds of work that typically goes along with data use. Some of the other items, of course, in the economies of scale that's mentioned, you see in the list the administrative support for new initiatives, trying to get a new initiative off the ground in a rural place where there's very little support for planning and so forth can be especially a problem. So an education service agency or some kind of support function on a regional basis where there's the planning effort and the database decision making or a host of other things that you see we've listed <clears throat> that can particularly be available, including grants management. Some school systems do not go after grants, and I guess we see a certain criticism here that there's been grant opportunities, but rural school systems do not pursue them. In many cases, it's, <clears throat> it's because it's simply uh, looking around in your district and wondering who's the volunteer that has the time to do that and then there's the issue of managing the grant itself. And so some support service has to be available uh, in an administrative capacity for that to happen, happen and also reporting services. So in many cases, that service agencies <clears throat> might perform some of these that give school systems as a group capacity to be successful with grants. Cost savings to cooperative purchasing, we know that's occurring in a lot of places and it's absolutely essential in saving money for school systems and consequently making some instructional materials and equipment available that would not be available if it was an individual school system trying to do this. So states can encourage this. Also the encouraging of course offerings on a regional basis. In some places, uh, career and technical education is offered on a regional basis in some places around the country. Uh, dual enrollment, AP, all those kinds of course offerings that too often do not exist in an individual small rural school or school system can be encouraged as we think about that in, in a state kind of way. Uh, professional development opportunities for educators, of course, are, are not possible, particularly in the subject-specific areas where there are small numbers of teachers. So again, thinking about how leveraging a regional approach of some 
fashion enables that to happen, and the concept of a customized technical assistance to educators, whether it's a teacher content coach or other kinds of support. As you notice, most of these we're talking about end up being support kind of people that are available or can be available on a regional basis if school systems will collaborate, share resources, perhaps invest some of their dollars, gives them some opportunity to have a support of personnel or a particular service that they could not uh, have on their own. And one of the items that we see that's evolving around uh, the country is the support of the Grow Your Own programs. Uh, the candidate pool for teachers, particularly in math and science and some other areas, is often small. Uh, it can be in special education and in foreign languages. And so the issue of how those kind of programs might be supported at a state level where school systems come together, create some kind of an approach to grow their own uh, particular personnel that are of the caliber that's needed to change schools today is very important because it's well known if someone is from somewhere else, they are likely to go somewhere else. So recruiting somebody in to an area from somewhere else is a much less effective strategy than finding people that are committed to the area who are the right kind of people who can be given the support to learn the uh, qualities for implementing key reform initiatives, being objective about making decisions, and working with people in the uh, community <clears throat> are much more likely to be a successful school person who stays. Technology access, whether it's internet or technology services, this was addressed in the first webinar how simply uh, indicating to educators in, in the rural school systems that all this information is available on the Internet is not uh, viable if they don't have access to a quality Internet service provider and or if they're spending almost all of their money simply to get access to the Internet, then there's no dollars left for purchasing technology services. So some of these issues can be addressed on a regional basis, again, in the concept of an economy of scale by using an ed service agency to to make this possible. Program evaluation services, of course, are almost non-existent, yet now one of the most essential services that's needed for people to implement programs that get results, and that's where we all are today. The day is about gone, although, uh, as John mentioned, we had so many providers of so-called successful programs coming to the school superintendent door or principal's door saying we have the answer to your problem, the issue of vetting those in a way that there is evidence that programs work in the context of rural schools is becoming more uh, critical all the time. So program evaluation services are important for implementing best practices for students, but they're also important related to that next item of grant seeking, that without evidence of programs, and this is the case in states, and, and we know in certain states there is very little information available about the success of their rural schools. So on the one hand, on a national basis, to compete for a grant on a national scale, to have no information collected with credible evidence of the success of the program makes it very difficult to compete for grant money without worthwhile and credible evaluation kinds of information. The grant-seeking services, in many cases, the ed service agencies will provide uh, someone who helps people know about grants and so forth, but uh, as John and I have uh, talked in the past, and in fact a colleague and I offered a workshop at the National Rural Ed Association a few years ago on how to more successfully organize and develop grants, and what we found to our surprise was uh, the people in this workshop were people wanting to, uh, in essence, provide the second income kind of situation for themselves. Uh, the reality is most rural places don't have people, and so they need someone to help write the grants. It's not just enough to give them the information that there's a grant opportunity. Other things uh, listed there, of course, are school improvement consultant services. A regional approach can help give capacity because they can draw on the expertise that exists in the region. And if superintendents and principals and others will share expertise that way, some of the best effective consulting services come from the very people in the region who have been successful at implementing a program that the state wants implemented. So it can be an effective strategy, as well as, of course, if there are consultants needed from outside the area, usually a, an agency 
that is regional in nature, such as a co-op or a RISA or something of that fashion, has more resources to bring someone from the outside that the educators may need to hear from that otherwise they would not. And certainly as we see budgets dwindling for travel expenses, there's less hope that teachers and administrators can be going to conferences far away. Statewide contracts, this can be common in some states <clears throat> where to leverage the most economy of scale out of the available resources that exist, a statewide contract can be uh, released such that certain education services or products are available to schools that they obviously would not be able to afford otherwise and obviously students will not get the services or teachers will not get the certain kind of product that they need to best help students in the rural areas. State supported common core of services. We see this occurring around the country where as states are looking to make its service agencies a better partner, yet they may not fund them very much. And of course we're talking to people I know in this region where in some cases the Ed Service Agency is almost totally entrepreneurial. They exist only because they're able to either win a grant or get the resources available from their member school districts. But in some states, if the state has a certain support system in place that focuses on a common core of services being provided by these regional assistance agencies, then this is a better strategy for supporting implementation of ed reform initiatives in the local school systems. But because of limited dollars then, the issue of a common core becomes important. What is the essential common core of services that the state might support that ensures that the school systems and consequently the teachers and ultimately students receive some essential kind of support services for the education? And lastly, a state supported center of excellence among ed service agencies we see in places where, particularly with limited dollars, uh, the old strategy of everyone being equitable in services provided is not the same as saying dollars are very limited, therefore we're going to have one entity in a state that's going to be with expertise in a particular area, whether it's math or reading or whatever it might be. So the notion of having a concentrated expertise in one part of the regional education system that it then becomes, in essence, a support system for other ed service agencies in the state for which all of them tap that particular expertise to serve their particular member districts. Obviously not as good as each person having, or each ed service agency having all of the services needed, but the reality of, of tight economics means we're trying to find ways where sharing the limited resources and the expertise gets a greater impact at the school level. So, Caitlin, Great. with that, I Thank you very much, over. touched on most of all the things that we had planned. Great. Thank you. Um, Kim, will you please unmute um, everyone's lines? All guests have been unmuted. Thank you. Um, we'd like to invite you now to make comments or ask questions about what you've heard today um, or explore how the ideas might relate to your own uh, state context. So feel free to jump in. Okay. Well, the chat box continues to be open, so if you'd like to make a comment there. Um, Susan Allred from Kentucky um, writes in the chat box that the presentation reaffirmed um, Kentucky's approaches. Um, they've relied heavily on educational cooperatives and collaboration. They certainly and that really does align with what you all talked about today. Okay, well, feel free to jump in if anything occurs to you. And again, the chat box remains open. Caitlin, this, so is, this is John. One of the things that people may think about is, is they need to seriously get involved in these broadband issues. Um, the FCC right now is considering changing rules on e-rate and raising money. And, and, and the plus to that is is that there will be a, a bigger tube going into every school in the nation Uh but many services are not available through technology because rural schools especially just don't have the bandwidth. The other issue that takes place in some of the states that are represented here is the whole idea of deregulation where the big telephone companies want 
the whole system deregulated so that they can use market value in their pricing or even the offering of services, which means that either services <clears throat> may not be there in rural areas or uh, there'll be a, uh, the expense will be a greater. So it, it would behoove us all to get involved in those, those issues if we see technology as one of our solutions. Yeah, that's a great point, John. Caitlin, out of curiosity, uh, this is Hobart, does, does the comp center facilitate or is it in a position to facilitate what might be occurring in each of these states in rural school systems regarding best practices? Uh, can the comp center facilitate in any way the sharing of those among these four states? Uh, we can't directly uh, do the sharing, but we can help uh, state departments um, plan for and implement that kind of sharing. Absolutely. Okay, so for example, if some of the REAP program schools where they're receiving the federal REAP money, if it mm -hmm. was known what was successful in some of those places, there might be a way to get that shared among the region in the four states. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Well, as we prepare to uh, close this webinar, I'm going to sum up real briefly what we've heard today from talking with Hobart and John. Um, a key principle for one is that support for rural districts uh, is best when it's customized to accommodate rural strengths and constraints um, and is responsive to context, which is something that Susan pointed out earlier today in the chat box. Um, the second theme is that FDA uh, can use a very wide range of support strategies to help rural districts um, with a variety of efforts, including implementing best practices, enhancing fiscal capacity, recruiting and retaining teachers, developing policies and partnerships, and achieving some economies of scale. And then finally, some uh, important supports that we heard about today include regional education service agencies, rural targeted resources and programs, a uh, designated and credible advocate for rural districts at the state level, and deliberate inclusion of and engagement with rural districts in state efforts. Um, we're going to follow up today's discussion with a third webinar scheduled for Friday, August 30th at 3 o'clock. It will feature Kai Shaft, who is the Director of the Center on Rural Education and Communities. Um, and the webinar will focus on the socio-cultural dynamics of rural places, how they might manifest in rural districts and in interactions with the State Department, and then finally how states might address any resistance to state initiatives that they encounter from rural districts. We'll be sending you um, an email invitation shortly. Uh, we'd like to invite you to take a very short survey. Um, about this webinar. Um, I've added a link to the chat box. You can access it just by clicking on it. Um, and later we'll send you an email with a request for some more information because we take these kinds of events, um, we take your feedback seriously um, and they, your feedback helps us uh, improve these events. Um, and as always, we invite you to connect with us uh, in any way that you'd like. Um, we have um, a number of mechanisms where you can reach us on the web, via Twitter, YouTube, and of course the old-fashioned way you can give us a call. Um, your goals are ours in lots of ways and, and these services are intended to help you achieve them. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Hobart and John, for sharing your insights with us. Um, and we'll be in touch soon with an invitation to the third webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>